Thank you, Samir. Thank you, everyone. Uh, welcome. Uh, really appreciate this uh, intro and this opportunity to be with you this um, full hour. So, um, folks, uh, hold on to your uh, seats. Uh, put on your seat belts. We're going to um, have a wild ride. I'll probably challenge some of your concepts and maybe validate some. So, uh, let's get going. So. I'm a big fan of yogi and uh, also the yogisms. And one of the yogisms you probably hear is, uh, if you don't know where you're going, uh, be careful. You may never get there. And the other uh, yogism, which is very famous, is saying, if you come to the fork on the road, take it. So those are two yogisms which are very true sometimes in the lean journey. And so let me ask you a quick question here. And you can either show, you know, I'm going to keep this interactive so you can, um, Samir, I don't know if you can see a show of hands, uh, but, um, you know, you can let me know how people are uh, responding. So Absolutely. Uh, with the lean journey ahead, um, how many of you feel that you are still making the road, you know, you're on the way, um, still creating the path? Some of you are on the way but completely confused on, on where we are headed. Or for some of you, is the road closed completely? So, uh, you know, you may be in several different categories or a category I've not listed out here. So, um, one of the things I want to do today is um, do a lean magic. I'm going to uh, ask you to draw three circles on a piece of paper just like this. Don't worry about the colors. Just write one, two, and three on there. And what I would like you to do is I'm going to predict your, the state of your lean journey just by you answering these three questions today. So uh, a little bit of lean magic for you today. Um, so the first question I want you to ask is, uh, you know, basically uh, let me hold on on the questions. I'm going to give you the rules first of the game. So if, if the answer to the first one is no, then just stay there on one. And so you may take a coin or something and just put it out there. And if the answer is yes, then move to circle two, correct? And then when I ask you the second question, if your answer is no, stay there. But if it's yes, then move to circle three. But if your answer is no to circle three, then stay there. And if the answer is yes, then move to circle one. Okay, so those are the rules, very simple. Go up, and then for three, if you answer yes, move to circle one. So let's start with the questions. I want you to ask yourself, my company has trained all employees in the fundamentals of lean and has implemented lean successfully in at least one core area of the operations. So if you answer no to all employees have been trained and you've implemented successfully in one area, then you stay there. Uh, uh, you know, if you've not done that, but if you have done that, then move to number two. Question number two, the primary focus of my company's lean effort is on employee safety, engagement, and overall growth. If the answer is no, stay on number two. If the answer is yes, move to uh, question number three. So question number three, my company is almost completely lean or has already completed the lean journey successfully. So if you say um, no to that, stay there. Um, stay on three if you've reached the three. And uh, if you answer yes, go down to one. So now I'm going to predict, based on these three questions, where all of you fall. So hold on to your seats. Um, so there are three types of organizations, lean organizations. A lot of them are non-lean, very, you know, though a lot of people are doing lean and hopefully you, you know, since you're on this webinar, I'm hoping that you guys have done lean. So I'm, I'm going to predict that you're not in that category. And then there is a true lean category, which really, truly they're um, at the pinnacle of, of lean and they've done it and, and they've been, uh, you know, extremely successful. Um, and uh, there is a big, big piece in between. And those are referred to as pseudo lean. So when I asked you to put one, two, and three, uh, if you fell 
in, in category one, which I hope you didn't, uh, you would be non-lean if you fell in category two. If you stop there, then you're a pseudo-lean company. And if you're number three, then you're in the true lean category. Let me guess, you know, take, go, go off on a branch and say uh, probably 95, 99% of you are probably, um, you know, in the pseudo-lean area uh, or maybe a little bit in the non-lean. Um, I'm hoping nobody says you're in the true lean area because I've not found a single company so far uh, which is in the true lean. And I'm going to explain to you very quickly why that is. So quick show of hands, how many of you fell in the pseudo lean area? Samir, if you can do a rough cut analysis and let me know. Because I can't um, see the show of hands. You can see, yeah. How is How is it? Um, where is everyone? I may not be able to give you all the count, but we no, have, in general. you know, I think your statistics, what you just mentioned, is, 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 is you know, it's fairly good. Okay, fantastic. So, hey, the magic works. So, so let me uh, tell you about these three categories, okay? It's very important to understand that. And uh, before we get into these three, I want you to understand where we are with lean. So the history of lean actually goes a ways back. You know, we think lean is a common, normal, you know, the, um, a current phenomena, but it's been around where slowly and steadily we have been progressing towards lean, starting with exchangeable parts, uh, you know, by Eli Whitney. Then in the 1900s, we had, uh, you know, uh, Frederick Taylor, uh, did the time and motion study and standard work and, uh, you know, his methods are, are really legendary. Frank and Gillian Gilbert, but without them we would not have the process charting and other things, which are critical to understanding our processes. The modern guru of uh, lean, in my opinion, was Henry Ford. He was really a pioneer in lean. Some of the concepts he's done, even today we have not been able to really uh, understand the power of what he did. and. You know, even Toyota learned a lot from his uh, plant in Baton Rouge in order to implement what they call as the Toyota production system. So, um, you know, we had obviously Edward Deming and Duran who are, you know, gurus of uh, quality who have done a, a lot of work and lean and quality are, are tied at the hip. So they, we, we owe our, you know, uh, lean uh, gratitude to them. And obviously uh, Shigo Shingo, uh, tai Chi Ono, those were the ones who really packaged lean very well, called it TPS, and, and uh, have seen the, the rise of Toyota. Uh, you know, we no longer talk about the top three uh, or the big three in the U.S., uh, you know, and, and Japanese took over the, the automotive market. So my question to you is, do you think, you know, uh, where we are going with, you know, James Womack has done some amazing things with lean. He's really brought it to the U.S., done, uh, uh, you know, and a lot of innovation is, is uh, happening in lean, but uh, my question to you is, have we reached the pinnacle of lean? Is that uh, done deal? Are we in a stable state? So uh, my answer to you is no, uh, because we are exploring new frontiers in lean, and we have to continuously improve the continuous improvement process. So let me give you an example. I've uh, started something called Eileen, which is from the human side, which is an amazingly powerful. Some of the corporations are not even ready for those, these type of tools. Started Lean Project Leadership, which is really applying lean in project areas. And I'll give you a couple of examples. And uh, the 12 Pillars of Project Excellence talks a lot about how to use lean principles in, in your project management journey. I've also created Holistic Lean, which is a Lean plus I Lean journey, which is a very powerful way of really approaching uh, your Lean journey. I've also applied it to Lean for Teens. I'm writing a book with my kids on Lean for Teens right now. And uh, also Lean for Kids is another uh, area I'm exploring. Uh, science of Simplicity is something you're listening to today. And uh, uh, you know, part of that will be something I call the True Lean. So, uh, it's still not ending, you know, there are some amazing breakthroughs I'm working on still and a lot of other people uh, around the world are working on. So uh, to me, we're still at the um, initial stages of lean and uh, uh, 
we really have a lot to look forward to uh, in the next frontier of lean. So uh, I'm uh, really passionate about lean. And uh, in September of 2010, I wrote this uh, paper called Keep It Simple. And uh, uh, you know, basically, it was uh, published in the Quality Progress. And, and there I say, every manager, executive, or government official needs to be aware that if his or her organization is not using lean, it's throwing away money or resources. And I really believe that that is a true statement. Is uh, I've, I've worked in the industry for, for several years. You know, personally ran over 300 Kaizans, worked with many acquisitions, have been uh, you know, working on, on uh, uh, kind of leading edge uh, technologies. But lean to me is really a powerful way of getting kind of uh, us to uh, you know, really a great state of, of stability and efficiency. And Six Sigma is obviously important too when you talk about, you know, focusing on the quality. So to me, uh, you know, uh, it's evident probably from this talk or as we go through is that I'm very passionate about lean. But, you know, just like you love your kids, but you don't want them going in the wrong direction or you don't want them to fail, that's my same attitude towards lean. We have over 100 years of lean, so my question is why are we not getting the full benefits of lean technology? And you know, if you Google the failure of lean, you will see any number from 50% failure to all the way to 95, or even some people say only 1% of lean implementations are successful. And again, you know, what does success mean? We don't know. It's a uh, you know, pretty um, you know, fluid term, but from my own experience, I've worked with over 300 corporations uh, all over the world um, and with several different continents. Uh, and I've seen that uh, there are some things lacking in lean. And this is what I'm going to talk about. So uh, you know, in my opinion, as a dollar, you know, as Mr. Washington has gone from green and happy to really uh, uh, you know, red and sad, uh, as you see, you know, we're going through some economic tsunamis, uh, and we don't know where it's going to end. To me, lean should be a way of you know, fortifying ourselves against these things. And I've seen a lot of companies who say they're lean, and they've gone out of business. So why are we experiencing that? Obviously, lean is not a silver bullet. It's not going to be able to control everything. But you know, if you truly are in that lean environment, you will have some control or better control over your environment, um, you know, compared to some other companies. So, so the key thing is you have to understand is discovering your true north of your lean journey. Is how do you do that? Is you need to understand where you are, self awareness. So, are you within pseudo lean, or, you know, um, are you in the true lean area? And even if you're not in the true lean area. Is that your true north? Are you really going to be aiming for that? And that is a really tough question. I've had a lot of corporations who say, oh, yeah, 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 I really need to be true lean. This is my journey. And once I start on their journey, they go, oh, my god, that's a lot of work. You, know, you really want us to do that? And I say, yeah, as a sensei, that is what I'm uh, you know, wanting you to do, because it's not a, you know, uh, in order to get something, you have to put in. You have to invest a lot. And true lean is, is that investment where uh, the returns are not linear, but are exponential after some time. But the initial effort you know, is literally pushing uh, a huge ball of wax uphill, which is not easy usually, and takes a lot of effort and a lot of uh, leadership support. So uh, if you don't have that, my advice is don't even make this your true north. So go in with, uh, into this you know, true lean journey with your eyes completely open. So we all have seen this diagram several times, the house of Toyota, uh, all the tool sets which we have. And um, so let me ask you a question. Um, again, show of hands, uh, Samir, let me know. How many of you live in a house? Samir, almost everyone says yes. Live in a house? Many of them. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any of them answers are coming. Yep. Yep. Okay. Perfect. So now let me uh, ask you another question: Is how many of you live in a home? What is the difference? Is there a difference there? Absolutely. 
house is just a structure. A home is something much more than just a structure. So when we talk about the house of Toyota or house of something, there is no emotion. There is nothing attached to that, correct? Uh, yeah. And we, are, as human beings, all have a completely different way. Uh, our emotional attachments are very, very strong. And how we work with others is very critical to our society. So uh, it's a very important difference to know, because this is going to build on to what we're going to talk about. So let's explain the non-lean versus pseudo-lean versus true lean concept. Non-lean is where you know there is no evidence of lean anywhere. We're just working in a traditional environment, not focused on continuous improvement or any improvement at all. Okay, um, there are companies which are existing with that. Pseudo-lean is lean which is skin deep, correct? You see it, but it's not permeated. So what does true lean mean? Let me explain a true lean state. So you have to really go zoom in, you know, almost an x-ray for, for understanding true lean. So in true lean, you not, not only have the, uh, the brain or the, um, you know, neuroscience of lean, but you also have the heart of lean. Really, uh, you know, your, your organization, your people have both of them, the, the emotional. But you have more than that is you are truly in a state of lean. What that means is you are customer focused. There is respect for not only internal but external customers, your suppliers, everyone. Dignity for people. Dignity for um, you know everyone who is uh, part of the stakeholder, your society, everyone. Innovation. You're truly at the uh, you know cusp of innovation. Always doing something more. Um, humility. Really, truly humble on on where you are and. Uh, above all, simplicity is, and, and we'll talk about why simplicity and humility will be such critical points in our journey. So that's what defines a true lean state. And that is why if, you, if I tell you that not many people, you know, I have observed or ever reached that stage is because the understanding of what true lean state means is, is lacking. But the benefits of being in this state are night and day, you know. If we're kind of in the uh, darkness right now, if you reach that state, you would be in a completely you know, bright sunlight. That would be the difference. So, uh, but the journey is very difficult. As a sensei, you know, I know how to take people there, but the key thing is, are you ready to make that journey? That's the key question. So, so here's about simplicity. This is a very key term. You know, we're going to talk about science of simplicity. So we need to understand throughout history how people have defined simplicity. Leonardo da Vinci, you know, uh, Mona Lisa is, you know, very simple painting, but today, you know, it's, it's one of the um, most precious art, piece of art in the world. And he says simplicity is the greatest form of sophistication. And I truly believe that, that, uh, uh, you know, that making things simple makes it sophisticated. Uh, you know, Uncle Al uh, said, make everything as simple as possible but not simple. So uh, what Einstein says is there is a level of simplicity you need to reach. But beyond that, you dilute the whole concept of simplicity. So that is the whole thing, is knowing when to stop, keep making things simple. You know, simple is the key, key aspect uh, of what we need to understand. In the present day, people have still not stopped talking about uh, the um, simplicity. and. Colin Powell talks about leadership as great leaders are almost always great simplifiers who can cut through the argument, debate, and doubt to offer a solution everybody can understand. And no matter you know what your political affiliations are, we know Colin Powell was a uh, was a great leader, and uh, you know he, he knows what he's talking about. And you know this is something which I've experienced too: is when a leader uh, simplifies things it's very easy for followers to kind of you know follow that leader and uh, that is where also uh, gets the root cause analysis gets you the right solutions of moving forward so so basically what I believe is you know uh, complexity and chaos are two sides of a coin so when I go to corporations all I have to do is I don't even even if I don't know what their 
product line is or what they're making, all I have to do is look at the value stream map, and I will tell you exactly whether you know they have chaos on the floor or you know the other side. If you have another coin, simplicity is is equal to sophistication. So uh, it, it's very evident. So if I see complexity, I will tell you that uh, you know without fail that on the floor there is going to be chaos. And if I see the value stream map, just a quick observation, I will tell you that they have their process under control and it's a sophisticated process. So uh, uh, this is kind of a universal truth. And uh, so I wrote another paper for ASQ, uh, Go Lean, Save Green, uh, in 2009. And the way I described lean at that time was lean is a philosophy of continuously making conscious choices. So it's not just, you know, let's do it. Uh, you know, for fun or, or uh, randomly achieve that goal, but it has to be made consciously by the organization to radically redefine and dynamically optimize strategy, systems, processes, services in order to remove the waste and to add value to clients, employees, and shareholders. Now, you know, let me tell you about uh, a French philosopher called Pascal. He wrote uh, a really long letter, about four-page letter to one of his buddies, and uh, in the bottom he said, P.S., Sorry, I um, wrote you a, such a long letter. I did not have time to write you a shorter one. So uh, it sounds funny, but it's true because uh, you know it takes time to simplify things. Making things complex is very easy. Just look at our tax code, right? It keeps getting more complicated day by day because you know nobody takes the time to really simplify things. So in your organization, you know. You have to start thinking, where is that complexity? So I had some time between 2009 and, and uh, uh, you know, a, a few years from there. And I said, this is not the right definition of lean. So I overruled myself. And I came up with a new definition of true lean. It's a science of simplicity. And that is in the 12 pillars book uh, as pillar 6 and uh, basically talk about why this is going to be a very critical thing for organizations and also for leaders going forward. So, so let me explain to you the three commandments of true lean. And this is very important. This is from my uh, paper, the Keep It Simple. Uh, talk about lean is about people, not techniques. Lean is a mindset, not a tool set. And lean is a journey, not a destination. So these are three, you know, Call it a commandments. You call it a fundamentals. Uh, you call it the foundation of lean. But these are the three forgotten, you know, principles of lean. I may say, uh, uh, which, if we come back to the, the back to the basics of these, we may be able to accelerate a lean journey. We may be able to get uh, a tremendous benefit out of these three. So, let's. Um, I'm going to give you an example and a story behind each one of these. So. Uh, <clears throat> So let's look at commandment one or principle one. Let me give you a parable. A parable is nothing but a, a story with a moral. So uh, in Bangladesh, there was a really bad ish, uh, problem where we had people who were really, really um, poor. And they, they really could not even survive. And millions were on a you know, day to day basis. They were uh, trying to do some uh, small businesses because there was no one to hire them. So they were either making you know, straw baskets or, uh, you know, tending to goats or some other things. And if they needed money for any important thing, they had these loan sharks who would offer them big sums of money uh, and basically ask them to sign over the house and uh, ask for a huge amount of interest. And that was really taking these people into a really bad, um, uh, you know, area where they were losing their lives, literally. So. One of the person who was uh, Muhammad Yunus, you probably have heard of, of him. He won the Nobel Prize and currently is in some, uh, also facing some political issues and other issues. But the core understanding you have to think about is what he developed was something called microfinance, which is all over the world now. You can apply it in Bangladesh or in Chicago or in Detroit. And he started loaning money only to the extent which people needed. And from their point of view, how can they be successful? The terms were very amicable, but those people were able to afford to pay them back. So with this simple solution, he was able to save 
not only this generation but future generations. So, so very simple commandment. So the moral of this is identify and solve the villain problem impacting our people. So who is the villain? Was it the loan sharks? Was it the system? Was it poverty? You can say all of the above. But if you don't identify that, how are you going to solve a problem for the people? So he turned this problem around and said, what do the people want? Same thing with Lean S. What does the customer want? But customer does not mean only the external customer. We have to look at it beyond that. So the first commandment is true lean is about people, not techniques. So say, um, you know, uh, I don't know if you, um, you know, if you're, if you're a fan of basketball, if you know uh, the Bulls, uh, at some point we had the great Michael Jordan playing uh, uh, and the coach was Phil Jackson. What if Phil Jackson was given a choice between I'm giving you Michael Jordan, the best player ever, or I'm giving you the best basketball we've ever made. If you were Phil Jackson, who would you choose? It's a no-brainer, right? It's absolutely a no-brainer. Uh, you know, if, if Phil Jackson had not chosen uh, uh, Michael Jordan, we would not know about Phil Jackson today. We would not be talking about him. So the choice is obvious that um, the people trump tools or people trump any kind of equipment we have. So here is a really great quote from the uh, president of Toyota. He says, Hito Zukuri, or developing people, is the starting point of Mono Zukuri, or making things at Toyota. And he goes on to say, without Hito Zukuri, there can be no Mono Zukuri. So you cannot make things without making people. But you have to believe that. You have to act on that. You really have to truly imbibe that into that culture, and it takes a lot of effort to do that. So here's what I've found. Whenever I go to many organizations, they always talk about this, um, you know, who, who's the villain or who's the, the anti-hero? And we talk about Timmy Wood, or you may talk about the eight ways. To me, it's the eight-headed monster of Buddha. And this is in the uh, 12 Pillars book, too. I talk about this monster who is Tim E. Wood, where we go with transport, inventory, motion, energy waste, waiting, over-processing, over-production, and defects. So it gives you a face to your enemy. It's very important to give a face to your enemy. So basically, so if I eliminate, if I take care of this eight-headed monster, will I be lean? Probably not. That is still pseudo-lean. And this is where we are caught. The reason we're pseudo-lean is we're focused on this villain. We spend a lot of time finding it. Not that it is not important. It is an important villain. But you're missing two other very important villains which are you know, sneaking past you as you're focused on this. So the other villains in your organization are the modulating mura, or the variation in your production, in your equipment, and everything which goes on. Variation is one of your enemies. You really cannot run a good uh, facility with too much variation. Also, you have muri. Mortified Murray or stress. So what is the impact of these three villains combined? Let's look at that. So um, you know, if you see that your people are suffering because of that, you know, because of the ways it locks up our brain. The Mura, basically the variation, cripples our brain. And the Muri is basically putting us out of order. This is the worst thing which is happening. And it's happening everywhere. So stress, you know, just look around. You may not even know how bad, you know, uh, stress is. And also, you have to understand that uh, the, the science behind stress is that it truly um, kills off your brain cells. It does not allow any further growth, impacts your memory, impacts your decision making. That's exactly what we want our lean, our lean leaders and other leaders to do. And when you put them under the Muri, you are going to basically get a completely different result. And that is what I see time to time, every time in organizations. And that is why I dedicate a whole chapter in my book just to talking about stress and how to recognize that, how to overcome that. So why is this important? Because today, if you look at the uh, studies which are being do uh, done, 
Uh, for example, Tawa Perrin does a study and talks about the disenchanted or disengaged people versus engaged people in the organization. You see that a big portion, uh, and it's growing, is 79% and up are totally disengaged or uh, disenchanted. And when you have those organizations, the annual operating income is dropping about 32%, and the earning per share is almost minus 11. But on the other side, if you have uh, engaged workforce, your annual operating income is 19% up, the earning per share is much higher. So the difference between those two, the annual operating income between minus 32 to plus 19, is a 50% spread. That's huge. That is not random. That is by, there's a reason that happens. So how do you get there? How do you move from disengagement to engagement? <coughs> so this is a, a curve called the a Nixon's curve. And you literally have a good stress and bad stress. So there's a, a zone of boredom all the way to zone of injury. You have to identify where your people are working. But there is one more zone which I have identified, which is called the zone of pinnacle performance. How to really train your people, just like athletes, to get into that zone. And I actually have a software which is, becomes a coach as a project leader, as a lean leader. You don't have to mess with that. You know, you have to first understand the people. It's, it's very um, uh, complicated process and very time consuming. If you don't have the process, you depend on the coach, which will basically customize uh, the approach to each different individual depending on which stage they are in. But ultimately, they will get them all uh, you know, in 10 minutes a day to that zone of pinnacle performance. And that is what will be the next frontier. That is where we all need to be in order to truly be successful um, as an organization and also as human beings. So true lean is about people. So basically, in order to be true lean, you really have to eliminate these three. And you're never going to be completely getting rid of any of those. But you know, uh, declaring them as enemies of the state is number one. Give them a face. Go after them. Don't let them sneak past you because you will always be in the pseudo lean uh, state if you do not do that. So when, you, when I run Kaizen events, uh, literally around the world, sometimes I've not met the team at all. And uh, by the end of the week, uh, we have comments like, my god, you know, if I, I've worked here for about 35 years, never been able to make such a big impact in my organizations. And um, you know, even on Thursday, I would not have guessed where we are on Friday, the results which we have seen. So how do you get them to that performance level where you really motivate, band the team to a whole new level? And that is where true lean can help. That is where uh, the, the investment you put in the people can truly pay off and, and get you some results which are beyond the wildest dreams. And I've done it many times, and I'll show you a couple of examples uh, in this presentation. So the Tower of true lean is if you want one year of success using lean, focus on products. If you want 10 years of success using lean, focus on systems. But if you want eternal success using true lean, focus on the people. So this is the Tao of uh, true lean. And in my book, I talk about appreciating assets. One whole pillar is dedicated to that. And what I talk about is people should be considered as the prime appreciating asset in any organization. The very first day is the worst day for the person as you train them, as you invest in them. They can only get better and better. Any other equipment you buy literally starts depreciating on day one. So this is an important concept for all leaders to understand. So you have to understand is um, how do you apply this. So let me give you a, a case study. I was working in a company in Mexico making uh, furniture. And they were making these huge um, sofas, two-seaters, three-seaters, and uh, with, with heavy mechanism. <coughs> and we had these. Um, people actually lifting these heavy sofas and bringing them about almost uh, you know, uh, 20 yards or so onto a conveyor belt and putting them on. And <clears throat> basically, we were, there was obviously a lot of motion waste and a lot of uh, waiting waste because people had to wait for them to move that. But also, you can see there was a lot of variation during the day because they were getting tired by the, you know, by, uh, you know just after lunch, 
uh, these people were literally slowing down completely. Or you could actually see a shift in the production in the afternoon, and the variation was really impacting the productivity. And obviously, these guys were really not motivated to lift any more sofas after some time, and they were getting burnt out, literally. So uh, when I looked at that, uh, you know, I said, you know, something needs to be done. Though this was not a directive from the uh, uh, CFO who I was working for and the COO, but when I explained to them the issue, they said, Adil, help us solve this. So one of the things we did, obviously, is a manufacturer, uh, you know, a sofa making company. So I had them, I designed this simple card for them of how to really put the sofa on there. And then this table, if you can see, has a open, uh, the arms swing up and down so that you can put a two-seater or a three-seater. And then I could rotate these two blocks which hold them up. With a single seater, you would not need that. So you could drop those actually down below into the compartment with a lever. But the key thing was, this is on casters. So you could actually work on this, but as you progress through the line, I, I basically put in a, a what I call a d demand flow technology line, a DFT or a advanced flow line in this company. And the productivity overall had gone, uh, you know, literally over 150 percent uh, as soon as we implemented it. But what I was most proud of is what we did for the people because if you see out here, all they had to do was take this card, bring it on this platform. So if you look, you know, the picture where this person is holding the cardboard, uh, at the bottom you see this uh, uh, kind of a platform. They had a foot switch which they can raise it and just light this sofa right on there and package it and then move it on to the conveyor belt. So basically the stress, so we literally eliminated all these three and we got them into a true lean state. And that to me is, is really focusing on the people and that gives you the long-term success because uh, unless we did that, we would still be struggling with, you know, our, our results would not have been that great. So. Um, so that, you know, to me, I spend a lot of time on, on, on the commandment one because it's very important. So now we're going to go through the other two uh, quickly, but if you have any questions, don't hesitate to ask. So a parable about uh, commandment two, um, let me tell you a, a story. There was a, uh, a person who was a linguist, so he, he knew almost about 10 different languages, and uh, so in the olden days, they had a a way of going to a king and challenging them, and if, the, if they win the challenge, then they get gold from the king. So this person went to one of the great kings um, and said, hey, you know, uh, call all your ministers, all the wise people in your, uh, uh, in your area, and then I'm going to speak in different languages. They can ask me any question, but by tomorrow morning, they have to tell me what is my uh, you know, mother tongue or what is my native tongue. And obviously, that time, there was no internet, no Google. Uh, so King had to rely on his people. So uh, everyone gave up. They said, there's no way this guy is so fluent in the languages. There's no way I can tell. One of his, uh, the King's favorite minister uh, said, uh, don't worry, King. You, know, you won't have to uh, give out the goal. But also, the King loses prestige because this person was from his uh, competing kingdom. So. Um, this minister, basically, in the morning, when this um, uh, linguist came by and said, OK, he was very proud. He knew that there's no way they can guess. So uh, this uh, person, you know, a minister, says, you have this uh, uh, Bavarian kind of uh, you know, background, and that is where your native language is from. And this guy was, he almost fell down. He could not believe that this person guessed it. He says, you know, I cannot believe that you guessed it, but just tell me, please, enlighten me how you guessed this. And um, so this minister says, did anything happen last night? He says, yeah, I mean, in the middle of the night, the small boy came by and you know, started knocking. And when I opened, he threw water on me and ran away. And so he says, what did you do? He says, I ran after him cursing. He says, which language did he lose? He used to curse. And that's when this guy's eyes became, you know, wide open. So basically, we all go back to our instincts. And our instincts is that native language or the mother tongue. So the question is, what is our native language? And that is what we need to know. So the moral is know your instincts and your mindset. 
because if lean is not your instinctive tool, if lean is not the one you always depend on, if lean is not the mindset but a tool set, you will never be too lean. So that is what you have to understand. Um, so the key thing about lean, we talk about the lean culture. So let me talk a little bit about you know uh, one of famous sayings by Mahatma Gandhi is nation's culture resides in the hearts and soul of its people. Very true for your organization, for your family, for everything. It's about the people. One person cannot build a culture, but collectively we build a culture. So culture is a transformation or, or transfer of uh, you know your your knowledge, your thoughts between two people. And then when it becomes collective, now you have a culture. And it's very evident when you go through, you know, I'm a big uh, fan of studying cultures of organizations. I'm doing my PhD in performance psychology and study a lot about how to really enhance cultures, not just change cultures. So, um, so collective mindset of culture is non-lean. They don't know which tools to use. They just go and pick whatever tool they need. And pseudo-lean, one or two people may need know a tool, but they switch back and forth between some other tools and lean. And true lean, everyone is thinking the same way. And everyone is talking about lean tools, no matter what the issue is. And I've had organizations who do that really be very successful. No matter if they're looking for acquisition or doing other things, they always have the lean champions or lean senseis or the lean uh, leaders run that show and show them the leanest way of getting there. And that would be a true lean collective mindset. So a case study of a lean mindset is what I've written in the book is uh, one of the key concepts of uh, lean is the non-value added, value added, and necessary non-value add. And you know, so how do you take this mindset and apply it everywhere? One of the organizations I write about there were meetings from morning to evening. You know, they would uh, literally be having meetings to discuss the meetings. So I call it a meta site, death of resource efficiency by meetings. So in order to prevent the meta site, uh, I use lean tools and I show how to do that. Also today, all leaders are bombarded with information from social media, from everywhere. And so preventing information overload is going to be the key thing for future leaders, how to synthesize info, data and make it information you can use. Okay, so um, so basically, uh, how to use this is uh, if you start using this in different ways uh, throughout your organization, you end up going towards your lean, true lean state. So let me talk about a parable number three, uh, which is again has a moral behind it, is so that. There was once an a enlightened master who was going through a forest and he sees this monkey and the monkey is really desperate. He says, uh, Master, I really want to be enlightened. Please help me. I, I want to be like you. So this master, you know, takes pity and sees that he is sincere. So he says, okay, I'm giving you this plant. He, he has a small plant and he says, it's a magic plant. If you plant it uh, and take care of it, in two years, it's going to flower and, and flourish and have fruits. And as soon as that happens, that will be, you know, the, your enlightenment too. It will lead to your enlightenment. So this monkey is extremely happy, you know. So uh, plants this tree and uh, the, the small plant and um, starts taking care of it. So uh, after about as time passes, after two years, the master is walking by that area again, and. Uh, he looks at the monkey is uh, you know kind of very sad and he's sitting next to this uh, you know place where they planted this and it's just soil there is nothing there he says what happened he says you cheated me there was you know there's not a magic plant I took care of it every day and nothing happened he says how did you take care of it that's what the master has he says well every day I would remove it from the roots check the roots to see if they're growing and put it back again and the master goes, you know, uh, uh, probably that's not the best, uh, you know, uh, candidate to have for uh, enlightenment. So sometimes the masters make mistakes too. So what happens is, the moral of the story is, faith and patience are always critical to bearing long-term fruits. So faith and patience are very critical in understanding 
where you're going and how will you reach there. You cannot be looking at your lean journey every day and say, am I lean yet? Am I lean yet? And that's not going to help. And I see some corporations, you know, celebrate uh, when they're just getting started on a lean journey, thinking, oh my God, we're, we're there. Uh, we're really at the pinnacle of lean. And that really is a, a wrong way to look at it. So basically, it brings us to the last commandment, lean is a journey. So true lean is a journey, not a destination. So when I asked you this last question, my company is almost lean, almost lean or has already completed the lean journey successfully. Um, basically, uh, it's a trick question because if I ask you, are you humble, if you answer yes, what does that mean? You go back to, you know, start all over, right? So that's what I asked you to do is, you know, you can be lean because lean is a process. It's a continuous improvement process. That means you are perfect, and as organizations, that is almost impossible state to reach. So even Toyota today does not claim they uh, have reached that uh, stage of lean. So, so basically, what we have to decide is as leaders or, or as you know, uh, organizations, uh, what I see is the flavor X syndrome, right? Flavor of the day, flavor of the month, whatever you call it. And then there is the lean flavor. So what we need to do is make a choice. Make a choice and stick to one flavor. And so who is the person who will be making that choice? That will be your leader. The leaders will make the choice. So you know, in order to, for uh, commandment number three to work, your leaders need to be at that stage. So I talk a lot about that in my book. I talk about pseudo leaders versus sensor leaders. Pseudo leaders are always chasing, reacting, almost like chasing, you know, uh, holding on to the tail of the tiger. Not a comfortable situation. So when you start, you know, uh, always reacting to the new flavor of the month or the new thing happening, uh, you have a danger. You're in a dangerous situation. Versus a sense a leader speaks, trains one thing properly, and writes it. There is still some anxiety there, but they know exactly where they're going. Um, Example of pseudo leader versus sensor leaders. Uh, some other leaders, I, what I've seen in organizations is, in order to grow tall, what they try to do is cut off other people's legs. So uh, that is, you know, very big trend in leadership is how do I grow? But the only way I can grow is by, <clears throat> you know, hurting other people. That is, you know, not the way. Even Napoleon Hill says is the secret of success is not to harm other people, is to do it yourself. So. Uh, if you remember the Tanya Harding story with Nancy Kerrigan, uh, you know what happened. She tried to, you know, hurt her um, uh, uh, opponent, and basically, today, though Tanya Harding was really awesome in her skills, <coughs> we don't consider her as a skating great. Whereas, if you look at Scott Hamilton, who's really—I don't know if you've seen him—he's really short, but uh, he's a Canadian great, and he teaches kids. He's uh, faced cancer a couple of times, and he has become a giant today because of you know focusing on uh, what true leadership is. So there is a big difference between in sports, in uh, corporations. Uh, sense of leadership is a completely different thing. So how do you develop sense of leaders, or what is the key aspect? <coughs> is lead to me? Lead is about leave everything appreciated on departure. Okay. How do you run a relay race? Make sure the next person is more successful. And that's the whole concept behind sensor leadership. So a sensor leader does not focus on the dash. A dash is what will define all of us. From the day we are born to when we die on our tombstone, we'll have a dash between. That will define our life. But a sensor leader focuses on completely different. They turn the dash into an infinity. And that is how they define their success. So in my book, A Legacy Driven Life, I talk about living a legacy to leave a legacy, and also in the latest book, Change Your World, I talk about this concept of how powerful uh, this concept is for all leaders. So how do you become a sensei leader? Talk about five powers of great leaders or sensei leaders, power of delegation, dynamic leadership, visualization. This is one of my favorites, actually doing my PhD thesis in this area, and the power of lean thinking, and uh, most important, power of humility. So 
a case study in this area. I know we're going a little uh, out, but coming to the end, I have a good friend called Rob Bryant who's actually um, uh, I interviewed him for my book. And uh, he had an accident when he was working at a place where he was hoisted up in a, on a hitch. And uh, he fell down. And what he found out was um, the hitch was for first 50 pieces, which was not inspected. And the supervisor said, ship it. So he's a big Lean Six Sigma guru. He's a great fan. He's now a paraplegic. He's won two marathons. I mean, he's uh, actually uh, won two uh, Guinness book, uh, book records. He's created those uh, from his wheelchair. And his book, Walking Through Adversity, is really a, a great book. He's also spoken for ASQ. So let me uh, explain to you how I applied this concept. To me, when I apply Lean, I focus on what is my legacy? What do I do there? Uh, just process improvement or something beyond. So one of the operations in Asia, which I was working with, they had these big risers with these material in thermoforming. Each one was about a ton uh, uh, heavy, and they were bringing them in, in uh, uh, you know, to each equipment and then hoisting it up on the um, uh, on a big crane and then loading it, loading it here on another spindle and then feeding it into the machine. The where I've circled was the danger area. They were. Um, basically damaging the material, and, and also it was a big safety concern. There were people, there were about uh, 30 of these working, so there was a big danger to people with this. Uh, There's a lot of velocity through this uh, factory. So when I looked at this, um, I was focused on another Kaizen, but I really challenged my team to think through and said, you know, should we allow the safety if one person's life could be saved or one injured person could be saved? Should we not do it? So I said, what if we take this riser or this two-stage process and just feed it directly to the machine? And they literally laughed at me. They said, we've been doing this for 17 years. You know, There's no way we can do this. So I said, humor me. So we cordoned off the area and tried it. And by the end of this week, we had these top and bottom rows running as if they've done this forever. So you know. They saved literally seven hundred and fifty thousand dollars that week, okay, with some improvements they had to make on their uh, platforms and everything. Um, and they had other fourteen plans where they could basically duplicate these results. But to me, my impact on this organization, which is not from a money point of view, it was making sure that another Rob Bryant does not happen. And to me, that is what a legacy should be is as we go in, we make improvements as we create something. We need to make sure we leave you know, the area better than when we found it. So that is what true lean is about. And that should be the way we look at our North Star. So coming to the end of this presentation, you can contact me via LinkedIn or a deal at pinnacleprocess.com. Or you can visit my website, www.pinnacleprocess.com. So thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. And Samir, it's all yours. Thank you, Adil. Um, great presentation. And, um, and uh, um, I, I, you know, this was really uh, an eye-opener in terms of uh, transitioning from Surulene to Trulene. And um, uh, just a, a reminder for audience is, the uh, uh, the presentation is being recorded and it will be posted in the uh, Lean Enterprise uh, Division website and in the ASQ library uh, in approximately ten days um, uh, after today. Uh, recertification units will be awarded by email. Um, um, we are now open to question and answers, uh, and we are almost at the end of time, so we will end actually promptly. Uh, official webinar will end in about two minutes. However, uh, we will continue um, uh, um, a little more, about five to ten minutes, uh, to answer question, uh, to answer any questions. And those question and answers are will be recorded. So if you can uh, stay a little longer, and if you want to check back, um, if your question is answered or not, or um, if you want to listen to other people's question, please. Um, you know, feel free to uh, look at the recorded webinar and feel free to share the links. Um, stay tuned.
to answer any questions, don't hesitate to either ask me now or uh, later. And then uh, there were some uh, people who said the correct name is Frank Gilbert in one of the slides. So, um, uh, you know, point well taken, and I will update that. Thank you. Um, well, we have a first question here, um, uh, Dan. It is by Gregory. And what were the five categories of the sensory leader? Ah, good question. So there are five powers of great leaders, uh, which is the pillar one. I talk about that is uh, the power of um, dynamic leadership. The, power the first one is always delegation. If you cannot delegate, you are not a leader. You're still at a different stage. Power of dynamic leadership, power of visualization, power of lean thinking, power of humility. Those are the five powers. And, and um, like a green belt, sorry. you know, black belt and master black belt level. Uh, we have overwhelming uh, uh, comments. Um, how people like your presentation? So just as the overall general feedback so far. Um, uh, since we have this slide up, I'm just just going to jump a couple of questions. Uh, sure. Uh, he wants to elaborate on on two and three. Uh, mm -hmm. on this power. So a little more example or a more um, sure. collaboration of doing three. Yeah, power of dynamic leadership is, uh, you know, basically I talk about it from a, a project management or a lean project uh, point of view is how does a leader, you know, so leader does not always, is not always a leader throughout the process, throughout the entire journey of lean or to a project. Initially they are the leader, you know, uh, during the initial phases. But then they actually allow the other people to grow. They give them the charge and they grow them. But in the meantime, they are not you know, smoking cigars in their office. They're actually laying the path for the next phase of that project or the journey. And they go through this you know, leader versus a, a, almost a follower or servant leader. But then towards the end of this, they become a complete learner. They understand where they made the mistakes. They learn from others. They learn from their own, you know, mistakes. They do something called metacognition, which is thinking about thinking. And they go to that next level. So whenever they go to the next phase of the next project, they're, you know, they are an upgraded version of, of their old self. So that's what a power of dynamic leadership will do. And I give you a step-by-step -step process of how to get there. I also give you a, a evaluation. So I have a, I have a very, um, you know, a uh, very detailed assessment which you can do on yourself or your team or your organization because this is about culture. So I show you how to really create a plan so you can transform your culture in each of these five powers. Power of visualization is, is just, you know, is the next level. I do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, work on neuroscience and uh, it is basically directly related to neuroscience. I have uh, done a lot of keynote addresses for uh, this topic and uh, uh, you know in my legacy book I show you uh, step by step how you can use this to really create a long-term legacy or a really powerful goal which will guide you through the rest of your life so um, I'm still developing new tools new techniques in this area and uh, um, you know it's, it's one of the the groundbreaking aspects which will change uh, a lot of things which we are looking at right now. So, any other uh, questions? Thanks. Thank you, yes. Next question is, any example of the mega projects in oil gas industry? Uh, any examples of uh, oil gas industry? I've worked almost in every industry. You talk, I mean, talk about from a, um, a forest industry getting trees to furniture to uh, oil and gas. Uh, the examples would be, uh, you know, work with a company which basically has been at this journey for many, many years, and what used to take them, uh, you know, almost uh, uh, literally um, 90 days to do, uh, they're doing it in one week now with less stress, less uh, effort, and uh, the ROI is through the roof. Initially, they thought they were going to get 10 to 1 ROI. Now they're at over 20 to 1. So, um, you know. There is exponential benefits if you do this right, but they're still not in a truly state. They still struggle in many areas, but 
they've come a long way. So okay. uh, work, uh, you know, with many other organizations, not just oil and gas, defense, industry, high tech, medical, uh, everywhere I've worked, not only in the manufacturing, but also in the business processes. Okay, uh, I spent almost uh, eight months last year with uh, in Europe working with a major um, uh, you know beverage company, one of the biggest in the world, and all we did was improve and standardize their uh, processes, and uh, the results were just amazing. I mean, it was truly simplification going from a, a value stream map which stretched almost the whole conference room to a one which we could fit on a small wall. You know, that was our future state. So, um. okay. uh, Next question is, what do you suggest for a mid-level organizational leader who work for a CEO slash leader who is not interested in lean? Um, don't do lean. <laughs> this is a tricky no, I'll question. be very honest. If you're leader, unless you convince the leader, you know, send them my presentation. Okay, I I am passionate about lean. I like changing minds and hearts in lean. So that is my job. It's not just about getting the results. And but if you cannot do that, okay, sometimes leaders need to know what's in it. You know, show me the dollars, and that's the language you need to speak. If you can talk the language of that leader and show them the benefits for the organization. You know, because rightly so, that's where their focus should be, is on the bottom line. But your job is to be a salesperson. And you know, again, one of the powers when I talk about that, you know, when I did a lean in my organizations, I give you how I became a salesperson for lean. And I did my homework, I did everything. <clears throat> you know, I faced, uh, uh, you know, in one, uh, organization we were extremely successful in one division in the next division my the um, CTO of that division really liked what I did he wanted those results and he invited me to come to that division and, and help them and one you know when I the first day I went there I happened to be in the lift with the president of the company of the same organization different division and he tells me a deal this uh, lean DFT thing is not going to work here. We are a totally different culture and different different product line. And I said, sir, I have, you know, I, I will take your advice uh, and I'm going to make sure that, uh, uh, you know, we, we completely take a different approach. And that's what I did. We took a completely different approach and the results were beyond what they thought. I mean, we had literally millions and millions of savings and uh, within about six months. So. Uh, you will face that. You have to face that. And I give you a formula of, of how to go through that process and, and face those challenges. Okay. Uh, just as a reminder, we still have 100 people. And um, feel free to ask questions. And I'm going to, yeah, I'm going to stay, to stay on and answer any number of questions you have. This is a passion of mine. And I want to make sure that uh, you know, I infect you with my passion. Great. Uh, the next question is, what is your estimation, um, what in your estimation is the proportion is sensi leader in the business today? Um, not even 1%. Not even 1%. Leadership has to be redefined and that's what I'm, uh, you know, that is one of the innovations we need is uh, completely redefine leadership. MBA leadership, you know, textbook leadership is not what we need. The Gen Y works in a completely different way. So I'm looking at it from very different angles and um, looking at leadership from a completely different perspective. And you know, uh, I'll be talking more about that soon. So right now, it's not looking that great. Uh, OK, um, then the next question we have is, can a list of all the book titles discussed today be sent out by email? Um, uh, you know, I, I would, uh, uh, instead of sending it to entire audience, I would suggest if, uh, Gregory, you can get in touch with Adil. Adil will be happy to share the yep. list of the books. Um, Please email me, connect with me on LinkedIn. Uh, my uh, email is Adil, A-D-I-L, at pinnacle, P-I-N-N-A-C-L-E, P-R-O-C-E-S-S. Do you want to bring up the slide? Adil, do you want to bring up the last slide? Yes, which has and, the email? Uh, 
Also, if you register on my website, you can actually download my paper uh, uh, to keep it simple. So uh, okay. feel free to do that. That has some of these points, not, not in detail, but so mm -hmm. deal at clinicalprocess.com. Or look me up on LinkedIn. I, uh, Facebook, you may not get me on there. I'm not, you know, don't get on there so often. Uh, okay. Um, okay. Other than that, uh, Adil, uh, we have um, uh, just the comments uh, that people like the presentation, and um, um, so we are almost. Um, I come through the questions, and we don't at this time we don't have any questions. So. Um, uh, what I'm going to say to participant is uh, thank you uh, for attending uh, the presentation. Um, my sincere thanks to you, Adil. Um, um, and uh, on behalf of ASQ, ASQ Lean Enterprise Division, and the ASQ Lean Enterprise Division Webinar Committee, um, um, I want to thank you for uh, sharing uh, your knowledge, and then and this is definitely helpful. I I love the examples you gave, and um, you know as the presentation becomes available, I'm sure many of uh, them would like to share this presentation with the management. And as you suggested, that um, it has to come from the top. Uh, so feel free, and uh, uh, being said that, uh, we would like to. Um, and uh, the webinar. Thank you very much, everyone. I think um, just that you've stayed through, uh, I know you all are busy, and you've stayed through shows a lot about your commitment to Lean. So um, consider me as a friend and pa partner in your journey. And if you have any questions, anything at all, um, you know, I will uh, be very glad to answer your questions. Or if you want me to talk and convince someone, you know, please let me know. That's uh, um, I can also do that. So thank you very much, Samir. Thank you to ASQ Lean Division. And um, uh, really appreciate this opportunity and uh, uh, look forward to the transformations. Thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Goodbye. Goodbye.